Does God care about lost things? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 15. I think one of the things that makes chapter 15 the most interesting is that we see many times when we're in the Bible, we go to church and we'll talk about this parable or this story or this event or this thing. Everything is sort of pulled out. One of the things that's really nice about reading the Bible in order and slowly is the fact that we realize he is sometimes coming up to a direct point with the numerous stories he tells. So he'll say a thing, he'll give a parable, He'll say a thing afterwards, and then he'll talk to the crowd. All of it being in the same context of what he was talking about all along. And so chapter 15 is one of those great examples where he's building up to the message. I even heard the Robertson podcast a few days ago when they were asked, what Bible passages would you pull out of the Bible if you could only carry so many with you? And Luke 15 was one of them. Great endorsement. We start off right away with the tax collectors and sinners coming near him to listen to what he has to say. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling. Look at that. He hangs out with these sinners and eats with them. So Jesus then says, what if a man had a hundred sheep, right? Lots and lots of sheep. Lost one of them. Won't he leave the 99 and go after the lost one until he found it? He lays it on his shoulders. Ah, isn't that sweet? And then when he gets home, he tells everyone, he calls his friends, he goes through his Instagram list. Hey, I found my lost sheep. I was looking for him everywhere. It's exciting. Rejoice with me. My sheep was lost. Same thing. There will be more rejoicing in heaven, you know, when one person, one lost sheep comes back over the other 99. That idea of the lost sheep has always been something that was very personal to me. I feel at times like the lost sheep. And I've said that before, that I feel like he came for me when I didn't want him, when I didn't want to have a faith in God. That parable struck me when I was hiking in England. I went on a hundred mile hike and I saw the lost sheep in the field. Everyone else went in. Everyone went in with the farmer. And there was one little baby sheep just sitting in the field crying. And it touched my heart because it made me think that lost sheep, he doesn't know it yet. It's about to get dark. But he walked away, and now he's kind of wondering, hey, where did everyone go? Jesus wants that last sheep. Not only does the fact that we're looking for the lost sheep and it's found, this person went looking for them and cared that that lost sheep came back. And what he's addressing, I think, is that when you're talking about the Pharisees and the scribes, the proper religious person just walks in to the barn like a good soul because he followed the right path. The farmer came out, I followed the right path, I went into the barn. That one messed up. And he's saying that God actively goes after those people who did not go into the barn following all the exact rules, going exactly the right way. He searches for people, and God is going to go look for more people. He is not just interested in the people who think they have that relationship with God because they follow all the rules. He's going after all of them. Then the next parable comes right in. The parable of the lost coin. Woman had 10 pieces of silver. She loses one of them. Won't she take a lamp? Won't she go looking everywhere until she finds it? Man, I lose things all the time. I go digging around everywhere. And when I find it, I am celebratory. She celebrates when she finds it. Tells her friends and neighbors, come rejoice with me. I found the coin that was lost. Isn't that funny? You lose money or you lose something. Boy, you're happy when you saw it. Says so same thing here. The joy of the angels of God when one sinner repents. When someone comes back, when that lost coin is found, just like the lost sheep, that's a time for celebration. Not just about, oh good, that sheep came back. Oh good, I found the lost coin. It's a time for rejoicing. So much rejoicing, you call your friends, you get them on your cell phone. This was done before they even had cell phones. They probably had to walk a long distance to invite their friends to celebrate with them. So we celebrate with the finding of the lost items. Now, of course, we're going to have the parable of the prodigal son. Again, man had two sons. Then the younger son says, he wants his inheritance. Give what to me, divide my property already. So then the son packs up, goes to a far country 
squanders everything, reckless living, doing everything he shouldn't do, and spent every dime he had. Then in the far country had a famine. Because he had no money, he started working in the fields, feeding pigs, which were considered an unclean animal. So first of all, we know this country wasn't Jewish, so it was probably farther away. And he was doing something that was considered to be unclean. He just wanted, it said, to be fed with the pigs because no one was giving him anything. He realized it would be better if I was one of my father's hired servants than this. Because here I'm starving to death. He decides he's going to go back into his father. He comes up with a thing that he's going to say. You know, I'm going to tell him I sinned before heaven and you. I'm not worthy. Just let me be your servant. As he came to his father and he was still a long ways off. So it makes me feel, and I think it makes a lot of people feel, that his father was constantly scoping the horizon, just hoping that his son was going to come back any moment. You know, and he's probably practicing that speech in his head of what he's going to say. And his father ran out, embraced him, kissed him, and the son said his little spiel, gave it to him. And instead, his father said to the servants, get the best robe, put it on him. Probably this kid was pretty dirty at this point. Go get shoes on his feet and go get a fattened calf and kill it. We're going to have a celebration because my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now found. This is our third lost parable. And I think, of course, one of the most famous parables. So just starting out, the word prodigal means reckless or wasteful. This is the man who wasted his father's money. Again, it's the Bible interpreters that name the chapter headlines. I don't know that Jesus would have called it the prodigal son, called it the lost son, the returned son. That was the thing that mattered the most to Jesus. It wasn't the recklessness, wasn't the wastefulness, wasn't the money that he lost. It was the fact that he came back. That was the point of the story, not his recklessness. And that's the point of the story for us, too. When we come back to God, We're not going to hear all the things we did wrong, a lecture about what we should have done, this angry father point of view. We are going to be hugged and kissed because we are welcomed back. Get the robe, get the shoes, break out the banquet. This is what God's about. I heard some comedian talking about Jesus and why would anyone believe in Jesus, such an angry, horrible person who just tells people, you know, terrible things. And I thought, I don't think you read the Bible. I don't think you read any of it. Because when you look at the heart of Jesus, he's telling you, there's no lecture there. There's no yelling there, welcoming home. I'm so glad you're back. That is the mood and the heart of Jesus. He's just glad that we are back. Despite the fact that this younger son made bad decisions, did bad things, and it drove his life into the ground. But God the Father is always there to pick us up and call us his child part of the story, too, where I got confused. So I always understood the parable of the son, the lost son. And I understood that part of the homecoming, the lost thing being found, the son who returns. But the second part was the part that was confusing. So the older son was working in the field, doing the thing he was supposed to do, being diligent, comes near the house, sees the dancing and the celebration. Hey, you know, what's going on with this? He asked the servant. Oh, well, your brother came home. We killed the fattened calf. We're having this big banquet. Your brother, he's safe. The older son was mad. He wasn't rejoiceful that his brother was safe and sound. So then the father comes out and says, hey, what's, you know, what's going on? The older son is like, I've done everything. I've worked for you every day. I've never disobeyed anything that you ever said. You never gave me a goat. You never celebrated with me. Then this guy who screws up everything, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, oh goodness, that's the guy you killed the fattened calf for? The father, it's so funny, because in both cases, the father sought his son on the horizon, the youngest son, and now the father is seeking his son outside the celebration. Calm, patient, loving. He was lost and now is found. We have to celebrate. He was dead and now he's alive. This is a celebration. Before as a Christian, 
I would hear that part of the story, and I'm like, well, what did that guy do? He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything that he shouldn't have done. The fact is that there's two levels to this parable. We're not always perfect. We don't do everything our parents say, and we don't do everything God tells us to do. So that is just not a possible thing. But it's a sense of pride. It's a sense of entitlement. Who is celebrating me? Why am I not getting celebrated? It's just such an attitude that goes along with it. In both cases, both sons are reckless. One is reckless with his father's love. I'm going to show you who can be the best son. It really is both sons that have done something. And in both cases, the father is ready to welcome the son back into his fold. This parable teaches us a lot, again, about the heart of God in the second part, too. The bigger picture of the story, and the part I never really understood before, is that he's saying all the rabbis and the scribes and the Pharisees, they think they're the good son, doing everything you asked me to do, always faithful, always doing the thing. And then there are people, the tax collectors, the sinners, the Gentiles. I mean, technically, if you look at it, if we traced it all the way back, God was the God of everyone. You have Adam and Eve, God. Then you have their children, their God. But as we became bigger people, split off into Canaanites, into all the various groups we're going to learn about when we get to the Old Testament. Everyone was meant to be a part of God's family. So when we welcome Gentiles back into the fold, we're welcoming the children of God back into the home again. You were lost. Now you're back. And the people who were thinking they did everything right, thinking that they were in the heart of everything, are like, wait a minute, I've done everything. First of all, you have it, and you haven't followed everything that was supposed to happen. Secondly, this is very prideful. And thirdly, aren't we glad that this wayward person came back to us? Aren't we rejoiceful that something was lost and now is found? They weren't getting it at all, just like the eldest son wasn't getting it. But you know what? The father is there, not just to welcome the young son. We're excited about that, but also to welcome the eldest son. And that ends chapter 15, Lost Sayings Found. We feel that. I think we understand that. Whenever we lose something and we find it, we're really excited about it. Jesus is joyful, wants to tell everybody, wants the angels to rejoice when someone who was lost is found, even if they were the youngest son or the oldest son. Both we're glad to have. So, what I'm going to meditate on this week is that sense of pridefulness, hoping that I never fall into that, that I never get into this position where I'm thinking, I have done everything for God. I have done everything I've been asked. And if I see someone who calls on the name of the Lord that I don't think is worthy, I don't know who that is, but imagine you're watching someone who has done horrible things and at the very end of his life calls on Jesus to save him. Well, that guy, that guy did this list of things and he is sitting there asking for God to save him? Yes, yes, he is. And it doesn't matter that I was lost for all those years and was found. It doesn't matter that that man, three minutes before his death, like the robber on the cross, was lost and is found, or the person who lived their whole life according to God's will or tried to was lost in that same way. Boy, that's a lot to meditate about. What I'm going to pray about is that I always recognize that God wants the lost soul, the lost person to come back, and that I could be a part of that by sharing the message with God. So I'm going to pray about that so that I'm more diligent about helping God find his lost sheep. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that everyone in this world is the lost sheep, is the lost coin, is the lost brother, who needs to come back to God. And when that happens, God will rejoice. The angels will rejoice because what was once lost is found. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please subscribe. Tell a friend. I would appreciate it if you would let others know that this podcast is out there 
because we're going through this so slowly, it is easy to catch up. All of the episodes are on the website, thebibleinsmallsteps.com. So if you missed an episode, if there's someone who doesn't know how to listen to a podcast, they can find them all there. And if you're looking to try to catch up or want to hear something again, those episodes are always available to you. Have a wonderful day.